Rolling Dice and Taking Names is sponsored by The Broken Token, creator of high-quality gaming accessories and storage solutions. Visit them online at thebrokentoken.com. Hey y'all, it's time for Rolling Dice and Taking Names. In this episode, the guys review Richard the Lionheart and Sunday Split. They also interview Ted Allspot, designer of One Night Ultimate Werewolf, Suburbia, and many other games. He comes on the show to give us the latest news from Bezier Games. Wait, I thought Tony didn't like Werewolf. Guess what, everybody? It's time for another episode of Rolling Dice and Taking Names. This is episode 130, Werewolf in London. My name is Marty. And I'm Tony. Tony, did you know that the chord progression for Werewolf in London is the same as Sweet Home Alabama. Okay, we've already established you're the musician on the show, not me. Just dun-dun, 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 dun-dun. It's like if you think Sweet Home Alabama or Werewolf in London, you would be thinking the same thing, which is why Kid Rock was able to make his famous song where he kind of merged the two together because it's the same chord progression. It's And it's very boring to play, actually. And it's very repetitive. It's kind of like the last one we did, you know? Hey, everybody, guess what? We're going to be actually <laughs> talking about games this episode, and we have a lot of games to talk about because Tony and I have actually gotten together a lot uh, over the past few weeks and played a lot of different games, and we're so excited to have, for the first time ever on our show, president of Bezier Games and designer Ted Allspock, which is thus the name of the episode, which Tony appropriately named which happens to be the same chord progression as um, Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah, it didn't take a whole lot for me to come up with that name. It was real simple. I mean, matter of fact, oh, maybe five minutes worth of thought, and we're good to go. <laughs> five minutes? Okay, I'm stretching it a little bit. Okay. You know, I'm finally caught up. I don't know, Marty, if you knew this, but I was on vacation, and I'm finally caught up with all my emails and stuff. I'm ready to go because, you know, I almost missed the opportunity to be part of something very magical this year. What was that? The fact that I don't have to play an old man in the Secret Cabal's Halloween special is coming out. <laughs> oh, that I am so, so excited about that. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, Jamie from the Secret Cabal is, is writing his special Alice, Alice, where'd that come from? Halloween episode, uh, Tales from the Grave, something like that. I'm really butchering this. Anyway, it's his third year he's doing this, and Tony and I had the pleasure, actually, of playing some parts last year, but our parts were basically old man number one and old man number two. Yep, that and, was, that was a, <laughs> we were typecast. And this year, he asked us to come back, and we graciously said yes, but this time we're not playing... Well, I'm not playing an old man. I don't think your part's an old man either. We don't give anything away, but... They're not listed as old men. These actually have proper names somewhat. I know. I mean, I'm very excited. I, I don't know. I got to get into character for this one. I, I'm excited. I can't wait to hear it come together and, and see, you know, Jamie does such an incredible job. I'm so excited to have that. I don't know if he's going to give us credits. He may not. And people can guess which people we were. It's not like we can disguise our voice very well. No, I, so. I can, I'm trying, but I know I'm going to do a horrible job because I'm trying to find practice and, and trying to find the right voice too. That's going to be dropping on October 31st, Halloween. Perfect day for that drop. Uh, so be listening for that. There are a lot of people coming on uh, to do this uh, show, and he's been starting to tease it. So that's going to be a lot of fun. But uh, hey, Tony, you and I got to play uh, some uh, games together, which w was nice. And one of them is one that that we've been waiting on and that's the new game from portal games alien artifacts advertised as a 4x engine builder card deck building not deck builder but a card building game and coming out at essen and we've been talking about it on the show and at least in our commercials anyway and pre-orders have been going out but yes we sat down we got to play it now we had to watch ignacy's how to play video Right, because uh, a certain person that we won't name, uh, who was supposed to make portal game videos, have not has not made his yet. Uh, but aside from that, we were able to go through it. Now, in fairness, you know, as always, that first game it's going to be rough. 
Yes. It's going to be a rough game. It's, especially in a game like this, and this is a game with any engine builder, right, Tony? Whether it be 51st State or Imperial Settlers, the rules are, are pretty straightforward, but it's the fact that because it's an engine builder, you really need to understand the cards and how it works. In this game, it's, uh, it's straightforward in that on your turn, uh, you're going to be taking one of several actions, and those actions are typically going to be uh, building a ship or a technology or exploring a planet or either activating those ships or technologies or planets to do things like fight other people, uh, gain resources, or uh, run your little engine in order to generate victory points, which is the ultimate goal of the game. And, and there were some unique concepts to the game that I personally enjoyed. One, one that I like, and it's kind of interesting how Ignacy did this, we didn't have the little wood bits the chits the tokens all of that to keep track. the resource not, bits yeah the resource all that that wasn't there because it was all in cards mm -hmm. and the type of cards you got was a random draw so instead of constantly getting that engine of okay here you got resources here you go there is some randomness to it now some people may like it some people may not you'll be the judge of that i know the verdict is still out for me i thought it was an, an interesting idea on how to do that well, the do the do that part is the fact you've got three cards in your hands and you got those cards split into halves and each has half has a different type of resource, yeah. whether it be green or blue or red, which represents a certain type of resource for like fighting and technology and uh, the planets. Plus there's gold for, for wild cards and you spend those uh, cards two at a time. You can only play two. How many can you play, Marty? You can only play two unless it's called the assembly, unless there's a way that breaks that rule. And see, that's where you start getting into it. I can only play two cards. I can only have three cards in my hand. Unless I can happen to find this one card that can help me out, that allows me to play more. Or you have a a planet in, in play that gives you additional resources that you can use to spend on your turn and along with those cards that you play. So you can see how it kind of builds upon itself. And Tony, I think the, the thing for me was those cards that you buy are double-sided. Uh, one is operational and one is logistics and they operate totally differently in, in how that they're used. And I think for you and I, that's the part where we kind of struggled with the strategy part, right? In fact, in your synopsis, you told me the next day, I think you hit the nail on the head. And what was that? Cause I don't remember it. Oh my God. I threw it right to you. So you could tell us what it was. And you don't remember what it was. You said it was, it was hard for you to find with 51st state Imperial settlers. You kind of found the point in the game where it's like, okay, my engine is going, let's start cranking out victory points. Oh, and oh, here yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was tough to find, wait a minute, where should I transition to go on towards the victory points? Because that's when I want to use the operational side of the card in order to help, you know, the technologies which create victory points based on the other cards you have in play. Yeah. Uh oh, now I remember. Yeah, I'll take credit for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You've, you've built that engine up and you're ready to turn the crank and then initiate the, um, reap the rewards from that engine that you think you've built very well. And you're right. The logistics and operational side of the cards on the other side of the board, you had to really balance that because some of your victory points were dependent on which side the, it was it an operational side or a logistics side on the card. There was a lot that we didn't get to see all the cards. We didn't get to see the combos. This game's going to take multiple, multiple plays to say, okay, when is that engine going to need to be cranked up? Cause I know when we played my engine never ran until the end scoring. And that surprised me. I thought I had something and I was like, Oh crap. I need to run this thing. And I did not. And it's one of those things too, that they say that's only supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to play in an hour. It took us more than that because we were learning the game. But once we got into the game, we started moving pretty quick. I mean, literally on your turn, you're playing a couple cards and, you, and you're activating something. So your turn can resolve pretty quick. Maybe if you're doing the attacking thing and the attacking thing, I thought was a little odd. There's some randomness there. Tony, you mentioned randomness earlier. I think there's more randomness in this game than there probably is Imperial settlers or 51st state like in combat you're literally just flipping over the top of a card and adding some sort of modifiers to it there's a random number from like one through four on there and then you're comparing it to a defense card that's in play against whether you're attacking you can attack basically the game the alien in the game or attack somebody else and then you resolve based on whatever that number was so there is some randomness there that uh people might have to kind of deal with and stuff like that but yes like you said it's uh, that's why we're not doing a full review right now because tony and i when we're done it's like yeah this is going to take multiple crank throughs in order to really grasp this game i think i did grasp imperial settlers and 51st state quicker 
but that doesn't mean I won't be able to get in this one once I run through it again and really see how it works. I just think it's a little, uh, mechanically, it's a little bit deeper. Last thing I'm going to say on this game is thank you for the larger fonts. Oh, the uh, variable player powers, which is nice. Mm. Everybody plays a certain race. Uh, at the beginning of the game, you find your race and you get a card for it and they have different abilities, which is cool. So I always like something like that too. And there's a lot of different races in this game. So uh, if you're interested, uh, if you're going to Essen, definitely go by and uh, demo it uh, and and see what you and see what you think and, and, and let us know what you think. See how it compares to some of the other games because we were kind of comparing it to 51st State Imperial Settlers. Uh, the box says it's a 4X game game they use 4x terms and stuff a lot of the people that we played with didn't say it was didn't really feel like it was a 4x even though it used the terms i think people when they think 4x they think a map they think models on a map they think moving you know and stuff like that so i think people kind of have to uh, uh break that mold but you know what there was another game that i got to play that you that you didn't get to play uh from cryptozoic called masters of orion which was also a 4x video game which is also a card building, an engine building card game uh, that I played with our Scurry Report friends, uh, Mark and Nate, and, and also uh, Chris was uh, here too. Um, this is kind of a little cool game too, where you have three different types of resources you're tracking, such as food and military and tools. And uh, on your turn, you have a, a hand of cards that you can either research to draw two more cards in your hand. You can pay resources in order to put a card into play. But again, what's the cute, unique thing? The thing with this one is, is you stack cards. You can have four columns of cards, up to four columns. And when you play a card, it has to be on top of one of those stacks, somewhat like London. When you, but when you cover that top card, you lose that ability. So all of these cards are super nice. So you try and decide, well, I, I really want this card into play, but what am I going to cover up? What ability am I going to lose in order to get this card into play? And these cards can create combos and all this other stuff. This one probably we grasp a little bit quicker than 51st State. It's a little bit probably easier to get into, but it's just interesting that I got to play another, yet another 4X style card game. It uses a lot of the same terms as what Alien Artifacts does, but kind of felt totally different than what Alien for Artifacts is. What are you going to tell me that's going to sell me on this Masters of Orion game for me? What, what, how are you going to say you need to play this other than you need to play this so we can talk about it? But now that you've talked about it, we don't, I don't need to play it. But what <laughs> am I going to need to do? How are you going to sell this to me? You're not going to win me with victory points. What is it? What do I need to grasp here? What's that uniqueness? You like engine building games, and this, okay. is, this is a straight, strict engine building game. It's easy to pick up on. But like Alien Artifacts, you got to play probably multiple times to see what all the cards are, right? That's the same thing with every engine building a game. You got to understand what the cards are and how to put little uh, combos off of them. The stacking mechanism was what's cool and what's different. And the guys I played with actually played the video game and they were thematically more into it because they recognized all the characters and everything. So if you ever played the video game, I heard it's really cool to play that game and seeing that universe again. But for me, I had never played. So I was just looking at it from a, a board game aspect, but still uh, it's an interesting game uh, to check out. Now the other game, Tony, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. We're get, I'm getting a news break here, Tony. Hold on. <laughs> Z-Man Games has just announced that they're going to be doing an expansion for Fields of Yar called Tea and Trade. Yes, I saw that at uh, Fun Again. Way to play along, Tony. Way to play along with the game. It's supposed to be like, ooh, while they're recording, they got this little news bit. Way to break the fourth wall. Thank you. Well, if you were to go out to funagain.com and look at the SM pre-orders, he has listed that, but you can't pre-order it because he's not sure he's going to be able to get it over there. So Nick, da 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 and I'm like, ooh, Fields of Yarl on the expansion. That's that's awesome. Nick, da 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 fields of y'all. What's da 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 da? Oh, well, just about all the things that, you know, hey, it looks good, tease and trade. Okay, but there's no little box where I can say pre order. There was no check. There was nothing I could do there to put it in our cart to get our ass and mule service over here because I was excited <laughs> about that. Yeah, because they're introducing a new, uh, uh, a new resource called. Uh, T. It's T, and it's a really a powerful resource. I don't get to play Fields of Yarl a lot, but when I do, man, I really, really enjoy that two-player heavy game. Is that like a Dos Equis commercial? But when I do. <laughs> when I do, I, I play Fields of Yarl. So anyway, there's, Fields of Yarl, yes. there's a little bit of news. But hey, speaking of other heavy games, I got to play Vital Lacerda. I probably said that totally wrong. His game from Eagle Griffin Games, Lisboa, which was a, a Kickstarter game. The art 
is done by Ian O'Toole and it's a big humongous board that's just absolutely gorgeous. I love the color tones of this board. It's got that uh, blueprint bluish to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks it looks really cool. So uh, our buddy Chris came over and taught us this game and Tony, you know, like games like um, gosh, a lot of his games like Kanban or Gallerist, when you get the board set up, you're looking at it going, how in the heck am I ever going to figure out what this is? And then when you hear the rules, it kind of clicks. It's like, oh, okay. Now I kind of see how the board's laid out and everything. That's that's the way it was with this game. Thematically, I didn't even know there was a city called Lisboa, I guess, that was in Spain that was destroyed by an earthquake and tsunamis and stuff, and they were trying to rebuild it. So that's the whole purpose of it. But I want to tell this because, Tony, I think I found a good way, potentially, to teach heavy board games. And we kind of talked about this with Lignum. Why don't we teach from the end? Why don't we go straight to how do you win this game? Victory points. Well, how do you get victory points? For example, in Lisboa, how do you get victory points? Well, I have to build shops and these shops will give me victory points. Oh, well, how do I build shops? Oh, well, you have to either pay with influence or you have to pay with money. Well, how do you get influence? Well, if you take this action over here, you can get influence. Or if you take this action over here, you can get money and kind of work backwards. I think that's a better way to potentially teach a game as a start, as opposed to starting at the beginning. So on your action, you can get influence because you're thinking, why do I want influence? You can get money. Why do I want money? So I, I'm just saying, I'm just hypothesizing here that maybe when I teach a heavier game, I'm going to start from the end and work backwards. No, I completely agree. I mean, that's how I do it when I teach Donna and the friends a game. I've learned over time that when I start teaching them from the beginning, they start asking me, they don't understand how it all comes together. But you know what's so funny is? It's become a joke. Guess what you need to do? And they all go, give victory points. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, so how do we get this? I agree with you completely. You're absolutely right. That is a really neat way. And they can quick, quickly grasp what they need to do. They, they, <clears throat> they know that the victory points are out there. They it's, know that they're going to do it. It's neat. It's completely neat. But remember, but remember when we talked about lignum? We explained that game really easy. It's like, well, you're trying to sell wood and the wood that's dried is better. Well, how do you dry wood? We dry wood by doing this. Well, how do you get the wood where there? Well, you get the wood by going here. Well, how do you get it there? Well, it has to be cut down. You know, we kind of, when you walk backwards through it, it kind of just makes more sense. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool about this game is literally all you do on your turn is you play a card. That's it. You got a hand of cards and you play one of the cards. It could be to activate uh, one of the nobles or whatever in order to take their action. So it's, it's like, what are you doing turn? Just play a card and you activate uh, one of the abilities that that card will activate. It's just deciding, well, what do I need to do? It's one of those turns you got to games. You got to kind of plan in advance. Well, I know I need to build that building, but to do that, I'm going to need this amount of influence. Or I'm going to need this amount of gold, et cetera. So let me go ahead and set up and start working towards that. Uh, we all really enjoyed the game, but I asked all the guys afterwards, which one do they like better of his three games? And the, the ones that we've played the most of are Kanban, Gallerist, and this one. Most people liked this one better than Gallerist. I think one person said they may have liked Gallerist a little bit more, but that's only after one play. But all of us still really, really like Kanban. But all of us also afterwards said, let's play this again. And I wouldn't mind uh, maybe if you, I don't know, did you like Kanban Gallerist? I can't remember. I've been waiting for the opening for this. This is great. So while you and your little buddies are over there <laughs> playing l this game. Lisboa. Lisboa or gallerist or Kanban. Mm -hmm. I've never had the opportunity to play any of those. You've moved on. You've gone. You've said you've played it with these people. You're like, Oh, he ain't going to like that. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that there is no way that I could sit still for long enough. Cause they aren't the gal, the gallerist and Kanban pretty long. The, uh, let's see. Lisboa took us two to three hours, but, but we were learning the rules. A and I appreciate you protecting me from myself. <laughs> I've never gotten, I'd love to play them, but you know me, you know me, you know my sweet spot, you know, oh my God, if Tony was here, he'd be playing two to three hours. He'd be looking at Mark. He'd probably be trying to hit Mark with the board. <laughs> I didn't realize you hadn't played. I haven't oh, played any of them. That's fun. You really should. Cause, uh, yeah, I really should. He's a great designer. Honestly, he's one of my favorite Euro designers right now. And, and like I said, the art on this from Ian O'Toole, he's an up and coming artist, man. It is, it is sweet too. But, but the, the, why haven't I, why haven't I played these games? Because when we go to the shelf, you said, oh, we need to play gallery sometime. 
but we don't have time right now. You know, Kanban, let's play Kanban. Ah, we, but we need to get this other one in. And, and we really need to play this living card game that's been sitting here collecting dust. Yeah. And, and I know that. And, but you're right. I, I, I need to play them. I need to get them some, sometime in the rotation. Uh, who knows? Maybe someday. We'll see. Hey, Tony, got another news break coming in right here. I bet I know this one, too. We just crossed 10,000 followers on Twitter. Ooh, no, mm. I did not know that. Yeah, mm -mm. 10,000 followers, which means, as we announced in our last episode, we're going to be giving away a copy of Massive Darkness and some of the Kickstarter expansions to one lucky fan in the U.S. And here's how you're going to do it. All you have to do is send us a tweet or use a tweet using the hashtag RDTN10K. RDTN10K. And in two weeks on November 7th, I'll randomly pick one of those people that use the hashtag RDTN10K, and they will get a copy of Massive Darkness, which is coming out from CMON on October 27th. So don't go buy your copy yet because you might win one. You got a, ch a one in 10,000 chance. <laughs> If all 10,000 well, tweet. If all, all 10,000 tweet, yeah, sure, which which they probably won't because, you know, they may be bots. I don't know who's following us. And, hey, I will say this. I'm I'm not paying anybody to follow us. I know some people, like, pay these things in order to up their followers. Ours has all been 100% organic. And thank you so much for all those who follow us. We respect those who follow us on Twitter. Uh, we don't try to over-tweet. We mainly try to tweet about games, so we're not going to be sending you a picture of something we're eating for dinner or i'm not going to be telling you i have a headache today or i'm depressed or anything like that we try to keep this on the up and up keep it about games try to keep it fun and uh so thank you so much uh for following us on twitter unlike our instagram account where it's even less and you get to see that in a whole bag of chips <laughs> <laughs> oh that's right you actually do use instagram for sending pictures of of food, food. yes yeah. i do moon pies whatever hey I'm just like, I got to do that. Now, you'll be proud of me. I achieved three Instagram posts this week because of how much we've played games. Three. Count them. One, two, three. Wow. Uh, I guess I need to go see what they are. Well, one is about another game we're going to talk about tonight, and that's Richard the Lionheart. Mm -hmm. And then I did one of Alien Artifact. Yes. And then one of Star Cartel. Oh, yeah, the new game from Osprey Games. That's a fun little economic game. Right. And last night, now, the reason why I was not invited to go play Lisboa. <laughs> is, Come on. You were invited. You turned down the invitation. Oh, I had to. My daughter was in town. Her fall break was here. And it's an opportunity. Now, Marty, we talked about Codenames Duet. Okay. She and I sat down and played, and that was probably the that was a blast playing that game with her, trying because she and I are on usually the same wavelength, right? But she gave me one, and she went animals three, and the cards that were out there were uh, snakes and a couple other things. But she also had there was also the word Noah, and I went for my first guess. I went Noah, and she just looked at me. She goes. You've got to be kidding me. I go, what? She puts the wrong guess on it. And I go, oh, I see. I'm like, okay, now we're really in sync. She's like, I cannot. I didn't see that. So I got her in mind. But the code names do it. Anyway, we put, so she and I and Donna played Star Cartel. Mm -hmm. And you and I got to play it uh, recently as well. And that's an Osprey Games. And that's a fun little economic uh, set collection game. How'd that go over with your family? Donna was real tired and she wasn't catching on real quick to it. And matter of fact, Rebecca decimated us. I mean, at the end game scoring, you know, you, you multiply the number of cards you have based on their value in the economic. Now we've talked about star cartel from our Gen Con experience, but she, you multiply the number of cards you have and the cost of that card. And then you add up the points of all your contraband that you've collected over the term based on their value. Well, Rebecca was collecting all this purple contraband. She was calling it chocolate bars. I guess mm -hmm. maybe it could have been chocolate bars. She was making up names for it, the Chinese food or whatever it was. But anyway, so Donna knew she was doing that. 
Now, one of the things is if you ever get the contraband at the end or at the highest value on the economic chart, you can make it the market crash and send it back to zero or, or one. Yeah. Or one. And anyway, so we're sitting there and we're playing. Donna was trying to drive down what Rebecca was collecting because she knew that it would cost or that she could win if the, if the price kept going up. Right. Sure. Well, she was doing the opposite of what I was trying to do. I was trying to drive it up to make it crash. Oh, yeah. So I think, you know, Donna said, oh, I really need to play this again. I was partially asleep. But Rebecca really enjoyed Star Cartel. And I, I know we did. I know you and I, and I believe Mark was playing with this. I, I enjoyed playing that game. Yeah, and the whole idea is, is basically you get a ship, and you're trying to get contraband to fill up that ship to take to another mm -hmm. planet. But when you unload that ship, what you do is you take the, the most of what you have of one contraband and you drive up the price of that particular contraband, but you discard those cards mm -hmm. and you take the least of the contraband that you have and it drives down the price and you discard those cards. The contraband that you have in the middle of those two ranges is actually what you keep. And right. that's the unique perspective of the game. If you, if you're keeping a certain color later, you need to drive up, but you'll end up discarding those cards. Right. So you're, so you're, it's a, it's a good tug of war game. And I, she really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoy that game. Oh, let me, we got another uh, piece of breaking news coming in. Tony, the first mini expansion for Feast of Odin is coming. Uh, yeah, I knew that one may not go over uh, too too well with you. For those who are newer to the show, last year when Feast of Odin came out, it was you know a hot game. People loved it, and it was one of those games that Tony and I played, and we went, eh, you know, it's 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 a good game. Eh. It's just what it's the we just didn't really like the Tetrisy part of it. And it's funny, I, I typically like his games, just like I mentioned earlier with the expansion to Fields of Y'all love love that game so i was really mm -hmm. excited to try feast for odin and and tony you and i just like yeah so anyway there is a uh, an expansion coming out so if you like that game get ready you're going to be able to um expand it and and play it some more and now uh, tony and i probably won't maybe maybe it will change some of the parts that we really didn't like about it i don't know i mean we'll give it a try we'll give anything a try i mean my goodness we're not that way are we where we don't play games ever again or even get a chance to play games like Kanban, <laughs> Lisboa. Okay, <clears throat> I see where this is going to go. Hey, okay. guess what? We got a, uh, a full show coming up. We got Ted Ospot coming on. But first, what we're going to do is our five-minute initiative for Richard the Lionheart from Simon Games. Five-minute initiative begins in three, two, one. So we just got to try a brand new game that's coming out from Simon called Richard the Lionheart. And this is from Simon and Spaghetti Western Games and designer Andrea Charvesio. This is a game that takes place during the Crusade times. You're going to be split into two teams. If you got an even number, half of you is going to be supporting Richard, who's out fighting the Crusades, or half of you is going to be uh, supporting John, which is staying at home and trying to take over the kingdom. If there is an odd number, then there's going to be a neutral player that can kind of pay, pay both sides. On your turn, you're going to take one of your guys and move it to a city in England. And uh, when you're, what you're trying to do is try to collect cards or some coins or victory points that will, inf that will influence at the end of the game to determine who's going to win overall. But everything has to do with the cards, Tony, because at the very end of every round, each person is going to, they're supposed to, take two cards and contribute it, a minimum of two, to a pool where you're going to shuffle those up and resolve a certain number of cards. Let's say for eight, four people, there's eight cards resolved. And based on that, four game-ending track tokens will move towards the end, and each of you have different tracks that you're trying to influence. So overall, that game-ending mechanism right there, Marty, is something I really enjoyed. That tension of those cards. Tension is everything in this game because, to be honest with you, moving around that board, there wasn't much to it. It was very interesting on how that tension kept ramping up and you're sitting there trying to count, okay, how many cards are in there? I really love that about this game. The rest of it was kind of playing Jane. Uh, 
so for me, this is what makes that game. Yeah, and that, that's true. As you're moving around the city, it's like, what are you trying to do when you move in the city? Well, there's only six different types of cards. Uh, there's three red cards, there's three green cards, each with three different icons. And as you move through the city, you may decide, you know, I really want to influence the battle track. So I need cards with banners. So you try to go to the cities where you can exchange maybe some of your cards for other cards in the reserve, because some of the cards you can just, they're not blind draws necessarily. You could pick up exactly what you need, or you may need gold that you can spend after you move in order to get a horse to move further or ships to move between cities or just buy prestige or, or victory points. But like you said, uh, once everybody takes their hand of cards and puts two cards into the pile, shuffle all those up. And let's say, for example, we reveal eight and there's four tracks that's trying to be influenced. Two of them are war. You compare uh, the two different colored uh, banners. There's red banners and green banners, one for each team. Whoever has the most, you take the difference and move that track closer to the end game. Uh, then there's also Richard who's trying to get home. So there's a track that where there's a Richard marker trying to move down the track. If there's more green cards than red cards, then that track's not going to move. Otherwise, that track, uh, the, the token will move to the end. Likewise, there's one for coffers where if there's more green cards, then the little coffer token is going to move towards in the reds trying to keep that from happening so it's this push pull mechanism that as the game progresses that as that point of the game is where people start getting really excited because it's like oh the game can end on this turn if this particular thing happens but then tony it's kind of a co-op game right because you're working together but yet there's an individual winner at the end yeah i don't care I didn't really? I just wanted my team to win. But you didn't care about winning overall? No, I didn't matter. Even though I did, I didn't care. That didn't matter. I wanted to beat. I wanted to keep Richard from coming home. That's what I enjoyed. <laughs> you played on the John side. Well, see, there is that, this push-pull aspect because the, the person I was playing with, Mark, he was trying to get up a lot of prestige points because what happens is whichever team wins, whichever person on that team has the most prestige points is the overall winner. And how, what did those prestige points get him? His team didn't win. He got nothing. That's absolutely true. So maybe he was too selfish trying to get a bunch of prestige points when he should have been helping our team try to win. Now, and when we say co-op though, Marty, I think that's the co-op because we didn't spend a lot of time discussing what cards we're going to put in there. We basically knew what we want to do. And, and let me just say this real quickly. The board is so easy to understand. The iconography, it was just straight there, straightforward. That was great. Which was good because when I saw this at CMON Expo in the spring, the graphics was not that great. The, the way those tokens moved and resolved was very confusing so they relayed that out so that all tokens move from the left to right they used to crisscross each other which was kind of odd made it a lot easier to understand so thank you cmon for listening you made a game that i went eh at cmon expo and turned it into something that i really enjoyed in fact the whole table enjoyed it another game from cmon that i really enjoy and one that i am happy to keep on the shelf five minute initiative is complete Broken Token is taking pre-order for their new Scythe Legendary Box. I talked about Gloomhaven on past episodes and how that can help you with setup. Well, you know the Scythe Legendary Box is going to do the same for y'all, you Scythe lovers. It's designed to hold the Scythe core game, plus all those expansions, accessories, and promos will fit both the Broken Token's current Scythe Organizer and the forthcoming Broken Token Scythe Expansion Organizer. Be sure to go check it out at thebrokentoken.com. Our next guest is a prolific designer that has brought us games like Colony, Suburbia, Castles of Mad King Ludwig, America, and one of the most popular party game series of all time, Ultimate Werewolf. Welcome to the show. Ted Osbach. Hello, glad to be here. Ted, thank you for joining us, especially with the love that we have for social deduction games on this podcast. Now, I don't know, did Marty fill you in about my love? If I had told him about that, Tony, he wouldn't have come out on the show. Now, let's just go ahead and be up front. <laughs> Tony is not a huge werewolf. He's not a huge social deduction yeah. fan. It's not, it's not werewolf. It's all social deduction games. <laughs> <laughs> but Taz is best because I can be killed first round and I can sit and watch. <laughs> but luckily he has a lot of other games besides werewolf. Tony, we could talk about those, all right? I know we can. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. He's <laughs> I thought he left. He found me when I said Yeah, I was like, well, out. that's it. I don't want to talk with you guys. 
<laughs> now, now, Ted, when I announced today on our Facebook page that you were going to be a guest, man, people were excited. Somebody said, oh. great guest. So the audience is expecting a lot. So, Ted, entertain us. <laughs> I, I'm, are you sure they met me and not someone else like Matt Leacock or uh, Stefan Feld or something? We've had Leacock on before. He's a... Uh, he, I don't know. He's, he's, a, he's a fun guy, but um, you got to kind of get him going. Now, Ted, we've met twice. Now, one time was my first time at Gen Con 2012, and I think you um, came out with your tick game. And the first thing I noticed about you was, my God, man, I'm tall, but you dwarf me. It's amazing. <laughs> how, how tall are you? Six, five, six, ten, yep. seven feet? Yeah, six, six, five with the shoes. Without the shoes, I'm not even six, five. It's kind of sad. Without the shoes, he's five, nine. <laughs> and then this past Gen Con, we were on the same elevator. I did not realize that. Uh, sorry. I'm Usually at Gen Con, I'm like in a perpetual haze of everything that's going on. So I'm kind of like, uh. <laughs> we were behind you and Tony was elbowing me. That's Ted Osbach. That's Ted Osbach. I went, yeah, why don't you say hey? And he just like froze. He went like all fanboy on me. He was like, go tell him hey. And he, he never that's did it. Well, no, well, you were getting off and I forget the uh, uh, young lady who you had with you that, I mean, compared to you, <laughs> I, I'm sure it was my wife, and she's a lot she's a lot shorter than I am. So, because that's what I'm thinking is, I'm like, oh, she's always at the shows with him. That's his wife, and I'm like, that's head on. It finally dawned on me. I'm like, okay, I know who this is. <laughs> oh my goodness! Did you have a good Gen Con? Gen Con was amazing. We had the best John, Gen Con we've ever had. Um, our booth was stuffed full of people playing games. Uh, we sold out a whistle stop on the first day, which is fantastic because we we actually brought extra, thinking that hey, we might sell a, you know more than we expect. Let's take extra to make sure we have it th for the whole show. And we still sold out, so that was amazing. Awesome. Um, yeah, it was it was a great show. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had uh, you know every year, and you guys probably didn't show up to this, which is sad. But we have the one night ultimate werewolf uh, world championship at Gen Con every year, and this year. And, uh, you know, normally with the, with the game, there's an app that plays, and there's background music and announcer or whatever. This year, uh, I did the announcing, but we had a live orchestra playing the music while everyone had their eyes wow. closed doing stuff. So we, we brought in, there's a youth orchestra nearby, and they go out and they do events, and uh, they are super cool. And, uh, that, yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was just fantastic. You can look it up online and watch. And it's like an orchestra. It's, they're, they're there, and they've got their instruments, and they're playing the one-night theme while everyone is, has their eyes closed doing stuff. It was awesome. Now, I, I will admit, Marty, that would be cool. That would be an incredible adventure right there to have that going yeah, on behind you. That's a great idea. And, you know, you talked about Whistle Stop was a big game for you. And then earlier in the year at uh, Origins, Wear Awards came out yeah. and was a huge hit. And let me tell you, at, at Origins, I remember that's one of the games I was interested in because I enjoyed the game Insider. I came to y'all's booth and I, I'll tell you, I rarely rarely demo games where I sit down and demo. I'll walk around and kind of see what's going on, but I was like, okay, I kind of got an idea of that and move on, but I really wanted to sit down and play this one. I sat down, played it, had the best time, got up, got the little coupon out of my book for $5 off at your booth, <laughs> went over there, plunked down 20 bucks, went back to the hotel, hotel that night and played that game for like an hour and a half and had the best time. That's awesome. That is such a good game. That's awesome. I'm glad that you had a great time with that. That's, yeah, we've probably heard, there are people who are, they stay up all night, they're playing that for four five hours in a row they're playing they're enjoying mm -hmm. it so much so that's awesome so i'd love to hear that yeah it's i, I really enjoy insider but the little twist of the fact that you have somebody trying to keep you from guessing the word and the fact that the mayor could be that same person yeah. is just enough of a twist to go this this is really cool yeah so one one thing that happened at, at so i it was either i think it was like the end of the day of the show we were playing with some people from the booth and a couple other people and uh, i was playing you know just we need enough people to play and so i sat down i was playing i, I was the mayor i was the werewolf and uh, the, I picked uh, um, Mary Poppins as the thing. And so they're asking me questions. And, of course, you know, the seer and the werewolf, and the seer knows what it is. And I, I'm pretty sure it was the seer who goes, you know, is it a musical at some point? And I just gave the stare. I looked up in the air. I'm like, oh, gee. Huh? And I gave him the, the, the maybe thing. And, I'm, and afterwards, you know, when it, when it came up because they didn't get it, and there's Mary Poppins. like, I just could not remember if there was music in that or not. And they bought it, and they didn't vote for me. <laughs> and then as soon as that person turned up their card, and I turned up mine instead of a werewolf, I'm like, yeah, Chim Chim Churia, Supercalifragilistic, Expialidocious. <laughs> and I was like naming three other Mary Poppins songs. And they were pissed. And it was awesome. That was so exciting. So that was that's like one of those um, event sort of things where you get away with it. And it's, it's so satisfying when you get away with being a werewolf as the mayor. And Marty, isn't the werewords, if I remember your shenanigans at Origins, that's the one where 
Rodney Smith from watch it play. Couldn't understand how to play the game, right? No, he understood how to play the game. He was horrible <laughs> at giving clues. <laughs> horrible. I mean, one of the, I remember one of the, uh, the clues we were trying to, oh, he was the mayor. One of the clues was textbooks. And I remember somebody asked the question, do children use it? And he went, maybe. But... I was the seer. And, I, and at the end, I went, you're the freaking werewolf. Yeah. He flipped over and he wasn't. I went, dude, what are you doing? He said, well, not all children use it, but, but children use the book. Yeah. No, he understood the rules. He just didn't play it well. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to admit, one of your best, America. I love that game. We oh, that's awesome. That we play that game all the I, I mean, for people who don't like get into trivia, I really love America. But more importantly, when's the expansion coming out? Uh, America has not sold as well as we had hoped. Um, What's wrong with know, these people? I know. I don't know. They're clearly anti-American if they're not buying the game. Um, but no, I think part of it is, you know, we knew in general in the U.S., there's a thing about trivia games. Trivia games are $20. And they're kind of like bright, shiny graphics and not a lot of gameplay. And so, you know, taking the game that Freedom had done with Fauna and Terra and then, you know, adding a couple extra things and kind of, you know, focusing on American pop culture and history, I thought that might work, but we couldn't get the price in order to make the game look good. You know, we had those big fancy cards with all the images and everything on it and the big board. Uh, in order to get the price down, the game would just not have looked nearly as nice or been as good. And so I think the price was too high. Uh, for the majority of people to go, you know, it's a trivia game. I'm not going to spend $45 for a trivia game, which is so sad because, yeah, people who've played it have really enjoyed it. And uh, I I enjoyed making it. And I, you know, I would like someone else to make up cards so I can play because, um, you know, I've seen all the cards several times. So I kind of am cheating a little bit if I actually play. So <laughs> it's one of the very few games of mine that I really can't play honestly or easily because uh, I kind of know stuff. So like, ah. Okay. Well, there we go, our DDM fans. Well, let's. Get some um, cards ready for America, so at least I can. I mean, you could bring in like the Star Wars stuff and things like that. Where I mean, I like it from the the wits and wagers concept of you know you got to just guess. At least here, I have knowledge. Where wits and wagers, I got no clue, but it's fun guessing. Here, I, I enjoy that. Even if you don't know, you can say, "Well, I think he knows." I really enjoyed that about America. Oh, good, good. That's good. Yeah, no, I I love the game, and I I wish it had done better because yeah, I, I would totally be up for putting another set of cards out there. I would have someone else do it, so I didn't even look at them. <laughs> you talked about we've talked about a lot of the games a little more partyish type games. However, uh, Bezier has some uh, really good little more uh, meaty games. You got Suburbia Colony, and one of your big hits in the previous years is Castles of Mad King Ludwig. And coming out of Essen, you've got the follow up to that, which is the Palace of Mad King Ludwig. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So Palace of Mad King Ludwig, it's it is it's a successor to Castles, um, both thematically as well as some of the the mechanics that are there. In fact, actually, you'll see some of the uh, mechanics from suburbia um, a little bit in there that actually weren't in castles are in palace too. Uh, but the big difference and the thing that I think is really interesting is that there's a ton of player interaction. You're all working on this big giant palace together. Everyone is, is working. They're all building this together. However, you're only scoring for the stuff that you do. That's awesome. So if someone else does something awesome, well, that's great. It's in the palace and yay, yay team, but not really because you're only scoring points and it really, it's a competitive, fully competitive game. And so you're actually trying to prevent your opponents from doing well with their part of the, the palace and make yours, your part as, as good as possible. And so you're, you know, preventing them from completing their rooms uh, and you're building things that, uh, you know, might be the opposite of their goals. And there's this amazing amount of interaction directly on the board, which is unlike suburbia and castles where the interaction really takes place in the acquisition of tiles. Um, here in this game, the interaction is all about the location of placement of tiles and a lot less about, you know, denial of, of a certain type of tile to someone or, you know, rack, jacking the price up really high for someone on something. Um, so it, it, it kind of twisted on its head, but you still have things like completion rewards, like you complete a room, you get rewards for it. Uh, there's a really cool um, e economy at play that actually doesn't use money. It uses swans instead. And these swans are also points at the end of the game. So you can use the swans to buy stuff, but then you're giving up points. And you're kind of trying to work all of that in together. Um, in order to do things. And uh, it's really open-ended and uh, just has a lot of variety. But anyone who's played Castles or, or uh, Suburbia before will probably feel right at home when they jump in there. But uh, it, it definitely has a totally new twist in terms of interaction. 
Um, so it's a lot less of the multiplayer solitaire that some people don't like. Some people do. I personally like multiplayer solitaire. I think that's totally fine. But some people don't care for that. You're not going to have any of that here at all. This is everyone is totally involved with everything else that's going on. And you're you're totally engaged with everyone else's turn is happening because uh, they could be cutting you off or setting you up or anything like that. So it's kind of neat. So this isn't uh, castles with a little bit of a, a different theme. I mean, this is a whole new game. So if somebody already owns castles, they definitely want to check this out because this is a different type of play style. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and it, like I said, it, it is different. And I, I, I suspect we're going to get some crossover, certainly for people who like tiling games. They're going to they're gonna hopefully enjoy this. Um, but I think there's some people who found castles, like I said, you know, too much multiplayer solitaire that they want to, you know, engage and interact with other people. This gives them an opportunity to do that, and they're still building something really cool. And at the end of the game, um, as you're working this palace, as you complete rooms, uh, players are adding moats around the edge of this palace, and uh, these little moat tiles. And the moat tiles are slowly forming the shape of the palace. And uh, at the, the the game ends when the two ends of this moat meet, and they kind of seal off the palace and can't be built anymore. And that's the end of the game. And so you end up with this unique looking structure. And every game is different. And every palace you build is different. And uh, it kind of has that same feel that Castles has when you're done. You look at your castle and you go, wow, what a mess. What have I done here? This is, this is amazing. Uh, but now you have it with like 40 to 50 rooms that are all connected in various different types of ways, which is really neat. So, so I'm reading here on BGG and it says, uh, straight from what you probably sent them, a clever in-game timer that puts pressure on the players as the moat slowly closes around. Is, is that the, so as, every time the moat, it keeps getting built, built, built around the castle? Yeah, yeah. So in the beginning, um, as you complete rooms, you don't place any moat tiles. And then as you clear off these stacks of tiles that you're, you're building with, more and more moats get built every time a room gets completed. So initially it's one, then two, then four, and then six. By the time you're doing six, the game is going to end within a couple turns probably because you're putting all these tiles around the outside edge and it's just rapidly um, catching up there. And you have a little bit of control over how that works and, and you know, where you place the tiles and where you place the moats. And there's even a, one of the special abilities you can get is to kind of direct the water from one side of the palace to the other to prevent your rooms from getting blocked off to block off other people's rooms. So uh, there's some really interesting things going on with that. And this is the first time it's going to be available to the public. Is it Essen? Do you have a decent amount uh, to sell there? Or you think you're going to be uh, a little short? Uh, we're probably going to be a little short. Uh, we were talking about before the show, we've had some production issues. Um, we had uh, uh, basically something that we missed that we had to fix um, uh, kind of late in the process. And when we caught it, uh, some stuff had already been printed and we had to go back and redo things. And so while we did get a bunch to Essen, we didn't get as many as we'd like. And the ones aren't even for the U.S. They're not even slated to arrive and actually be available until January. There's not a lot out there. So if, uh, if you're very, very interested in it, get down to Essen right away. You know, play it on Thursday, the first day, uh, and see if it's something you want to pick up. Because uh, they probably won't, they probably won't last with the show at this rate. So will you have any at uh, PAX U or BGG Con? Probably not. Um, it's, it is unlikely. Uh, you know, maybe we'll get some airshipped in or something um, prior to that. But I think at this rate, it's probably unlikely that they'll make it in time for that. So what I'm hearing is that you like the European uh, gamers more so than the U.S. Okay, that's all I want to know. <laughs> yes, I, clearly that's, that's, that's what's going on here. Um, yeah, no, it is, it is unfortunate chain of events. It just kind of sucks. Um, I hate when stuff like that happens, but at the same time, I'd rather have a game that's out there that's done right and it's going to work for everyone as opposed to something where, uh, you know, there's some issues that we know we could have corrected. So, and, and the issues that we corrected were big enough that they were uh, just to the edge of affecting gameplay, not critical, but it would be, I would not want that out there. I would not be happy to have our our company logo on the on a box that had those issues. So I'm glad we fixed them. Okay. Well, oh, two two quick points on that. First off, that's great that you know y'all notice that, and you're like, eh, it's not that big of a thing, but it can impact gameplay. And two, did you ever collect baseball cards? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that coming? you hey, hang with me. Travel this. Mm, travel. No, no, but but I I did collect Charlie's Angels cards enough to be able to form the entire thing that was on the back. You know them with the fire behind them, with like the silhouette of the three girls with the fire behind that them from the seventies. Cool. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I didn't even know. Like I was like mowing grass. I must have been like I don't know what ten or something when that was on. Um, I mean, who knows about what I was doing to get money to buy Charlie's Angels cards? But I had enough to form the whole back. I thought that was pretty awesome. So yeah, no baseball cards though. Well, no, but in 1989, and Marty can tell you all about this because this is what we did. There were, was it 89 or 99, Marty, when the errors occurred? What was the big error year? 
a- a- 89. 89. That was with the, yeah. Yeah. I, I won't start saying who they were because people will go, who's that? Yeah, exactly. But see, Ted, this is the whole marketing thing. You could have gone out with that game with the slight <laughs> errors and then came out with the printed one and the error ones would have been so much more valuable. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever been on the internet, but people don't like it when there's things wrong with with games. I try to avoid the internet. Yeah, I, I would if if at all costs. There's really no reason. It's it's uh, you know hate filled. You know, uh, uh, yeah. but yeah, no, no, that would be that would be a problem. I don't I don't think people would be happy if if that were to ship that way. I'm glad we caught it. Your other hot game that was at Gen Con will also be available at S and also, correct? Whistle Stop. Yeah, yeah. So Whistle Stop, Whistle Stop has a different issue. Whistle Stop, no production issues whatsoever. Awesome. We just didn't print enough of them. Um, so Ooh. like I said, we, we sold out at Gen Con the first day. That took us by surprise. We're like, wow, we, we knew people were excited about it, but that was crazy. Um, and, and it's pretty much sold through most of the spots now. So uh, we'll be out of that probably for another couple of months, another month and a half now until we get the, the second printing in. So that also took us by surprise. We do have some that were already shipped to Essen, so we'll have some there for people at Essen. Uh, not as many as we we would have put more over there had we known ahead of time it was going to be that popular. But it's a different issues, fun publishing uh, stuff going on there. And I'm not trying to point out a problem here, but, but what caught you off guard? I think you are. No, I'm not. I'm trying to understand. I mean... Ted runs a successful game publishing company. He's a successful designer and everything. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. Really? That game's hot? How did that, you know, it, it catches you off guard, doesn't it? You know, the, the thing is, again, people like the game. But people always like games when you're showing it to them. They're excited to see the new stuff that's coming out. And so you try to do the best, try to be as objective as possible to determine, you know, what size print run to do and how many copies of something. Um, but, you know, Suburbia caught us off guard. We never had enough of that. We went through, like, it was like four printings by the time it actually stayed in stock at one point. You know, uh, we were we were smarter with Castles in One Night, uh, the first one at Ultimate Werewolf. We did, we, we anticipated those correctly. Uh, Where words were really close. Well, it's funny, um, I was just talking to our... Uh, our partners, PSI, who does fulfillment for us, they have like 160 copies or something in stock from the first print run, and they're due to get another uh, shipment in like one week from today. Um, so they'll, they'll be out of it for like two days, which is not an issue, really. It's just kind of one of those things. Ah, oh, good. It's all cleared out. Now all the new stuff comes in. Um, but in general, you know, trying to figure that out and making sure you don't overorder and you're not spending too much on a game, uh, you know, copies that sit around forever, um, you know, that's, that's kind of that weird forecasting juju. Um, that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, unfortunately for Whistle Stop, we had no idea. I mean, people love the game, and that's awesome that how much they. But they really love the game, and uh, you know, it's it great reviews. People keep playing it, and uh, the designer has been working on. He he sends me these things. I haven't actually seen it yet, but he's been sending me the playtest reports of the expansion he's working on, and Ooh, nice. and I'm like. Are you going to get it to me? Because I want to play. Because he keeps on sending me these things like, this is the stuff they liked. And this is what was fun. And I'm like, how come I can't play? Get, send it to me now, please. But he's not ready to send it to me yet. But but yeah, it's uh, people are really enjoying it. Well, that kind of leads to where I was going. Because uh, what's in the future? So you have uh, Palace of Mad King Lugwood uh, coming out of Essen. Available early January next year. Uh, you were printing up Whistle Stop. Can you tease what's going to be coming for us in 2018 from Bezier? So I know you guys are probably very excited to hear that there is yet another One Night Ultimate game on the way. Marty loves them, Ted. Don't 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 hold against Marty what you can hold against me. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like One Night he, Ultimate. He, so, right, there we yeah, go. Well, then you will be game. excited. Yes. Um, so so that's actually something. So uh, yeah, even last night we were we were play testing that, and uh, before before I, I jumped on this, I was busy working on some of the artwork that's going to be in the app. So that's that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, that's some we, we can share. That everyone knows we're kind of obvious that we'd probably do another one. So with the ones we've been mm-hmm. putting out, um, working on some other big box games, some some exciting stuff there. But it's actually I can't really talk about it because I'm not sure which ones will actually stick and make it um, through the queue uh, that way. Uh, we've talked a little bit before about Ultimate Werewolf Legacy. That's in in progress, and hmm. you know the amount of work that that has taken has been beyond any of my uh, possible expectations. But when it hits, I think people are going to absolutely love that. And I am so excited about actually getting it out there. So that's the thing that's driving me forward on that is just wanting to get it into people's hands because it's going to be so awesome. Working on some more stuff for Where Words. You know, we've been uh, updating the app. Um, I don't know if you've, you guys have, have noticed that, but the, actually the app, we've been doing kind of regular updates, adding more content, additional built-in lists. So we have theme lists now that cover 80s and movies and uh, what's the other one, music. 
uh, just came out and we're going to be doing some more like that. And we've actually set it up so now there's a wherewords.com where people can go put their own lists and then you can pull those in directly from the app. So you can pull in like Ooh, custom nice. lists where people have entered things like Pokemon and uh, Star Wars and Disney and all sorts of other things like that, which is very cool. So you can just add those into your list, combine them with the list you have, use them separately, all sorts of things. We're super, super busy looking at the stuff that's upcoming um, as well. Well, I mean, just a ton of questions are flooding my head, especially about that legacy now. Because I'm all, now, Ted, in all fairness, uh, I enjoy playing Werewolf. I especially enjoy having the app out instead of someone liar. I do, they don't lie. <laughs> he's doing a good job. He's bluffing. He's he's working on his, uh, his social deductions. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> I, I, the first time I played Werewolf, I enjoyed it. So there, <laughs> the first time. <laughs> <laughs> the now there's another game and we won't talk about it and we kid about me and social deduction but i i do the app for werewolf is so nice to have you know moving on to another question <laughs> legacy what if so if i get killed in the first round i stay dead so uh so this is this is for um regular ultimate werewolf so of course we publish both ultimate werewolf and one night ultimate werewolf and one night is the one that most people are now familiar with because that's actually more popular than the original ultimate werewolf but ultimate werewolf is the bigger party game where you actually have a moderator you have anywhere between 8 15 25 our game really holds up to 50 60 70 people but that's kind of silly you have all those and then there's it goes through a day and a night phase and people get eliminated and uh you know it's kind of a, a longer thing it takes an hour hour and a half two hours sometimes to play a game um, and so the legacy version is really based more on that than it is one night. And so what happens there is people die for real. You actually kill them. Because that would be a true legacy game. Beat that, Matt Leacock <laughs> and Rob Davio. Well, Rob, you know, Rob's working on Ultimate War of Legacy with me. So uh, he is. Oh, okay. and, and it's only because he hates Matt Leacock as much as I do. And so he's oh. like, you know, this whole pandemic legacy thing, you're getting way too much credit for it. We're going to have a big hit with Ultimate Werewolf Legacy, and people will know who the real brains were behind Pandemic Legacy. It wasn't Matt. It was clearly Rob. So, so Ted, just real quick personal question for everybody. How did you get your start in this? So, you know, like most most people in the hobby, love board games as a kid, always played games. Um, you know, me and my friends, would you know, we played D&D and a couple Avalon Hill games, as well as the, the standard fair Parker Brothers stuff. You know, love doing this. Uh, you know, love video games, too. But at some point, uh, I started working on, I was kind of designing crappy party games, basically. You know, the ones I was telling you about, those $20 things you find, you know, in kiosks right before Christmas. Then you, you buy them because you're desperate and you, know, you hopefully never play them because they're not good. So that's the sort of thing I was working on. Then uh, by the time I kind of discovered Euro-ish games and, and more modern games, um, you know, that, that just, you know, like it does for most people when they enter the hobby kind of takes over their life for a while. You know, you buy everything you possibly can, you play as much as possible, you know, everything else space in the background, you're just playing games. I had, since I had already been designing games, this was like, just opened my eyes up. Wow. The, the possibility is here so much better. And, uh, you know, I had, uh, first things I published were age of steam maps because I loved age of steam. So I did a bunch of age of steam maps. Uh, in fact, actually, the first thing that I sold as a game designer was uh, an HST map called Bay Area. And uh, actually, I went to Essen in 2005, and uh, John Bohr, who, is, uh, run, who runs Winsome Games, said, hey, you want to stop my booth for a while? You can sell some copies of that new game you're working on, or the new map you're working on, because he's obviously an HST guy. And I said, sure. And uh, he let me there. I sold 50 of them in less than two hours. And I was like, wow, this is this rocks. This this is awesome. <laughs> I, I like this idea of uh, designing stuff and <laughs> publishing. And, you know, uh, it's just fun. I, and I really had a great time doing it. I loved Age of Steam and I was doing that. So I was starting to work on some other games as well. And uh, eventually started the, the company Bezier Games just a few years later. Um, actually, it's only a year later that I started it. And, uh, you know, Start, start Player was the first Bezier Games game, which is appropriate in hindsight, because it was called Start Player. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, at, I did, the version that I did was Start Player, colon, a collectible, what was it, a semi-collectible card game or something? It's not, it wasn't collectible, but there were different things you could buy. Um, you know, it was, it was my idea. It was, it was not a great idea. But, you know, it was a fun, fun little game. And uh, then from there, did uh, Ultimate Werewolf and a bunch of other things until... Uh, about four years ago, my wife and I, we were able to stop working full-time in our Silicon Valley jobs and do this full-time. Why Bezier? Ah, Bezier. Are you guys familiar with Bezier Curves? Yes. Yeah. So Bezier Curves come from um, a guy, uh, the guy who invented them, his name is Pierre Bezier. He was an engineer 
um, at Renault in France in the 50s. He was there and there, of course, at that point, computers were, you know, big room filled things, whatever. And uh, they were making car parts at Renault and they wanted to do curved car parts, which were all the rage in the 50s, you know, all the big curvy fenders and everything like that. But they had to do them all by hand. And so you had these skilled people who were like pounding out the stuff and the curves and whatever. And, you know, to make them consistent, it was really hard. And, you know, it's not like the Model T stuff where they were just like flat panes of, of metal. They had to curve stuff and it had to look the same for each car. And it really wanted to automate the process. So he came up with a very cool formula, which really defined what we know now as a Bezier curve. So this really, really elegant mathematical formula, which was used then by Adobe and fonts and Illustrator and 3D applications. And, you know, people who take advanced math classes are going to learn how to use that. So that's very cool. And I was um, you know, kind of a big uh, Illustrator uh, font geek uh, in the 90s. And uh, my first book that I wrote was on uh, Adobe Illustrator. It was the Macworld Illustrator Bible. You know, I was so into it. And I was so excited about writing this book that I contacted Pierre Bézier, who was retired and living in France. And he wrote a foreword for my, for my book, which was very oh. cool. And it was kind of his little story about, you know, what he did in order to come up with the solution. It was, it was, it was awesome. And uh, that was that was great. That was very cool. And so I was like, you know, starstruck with like, you know, super geekdom because, you know, <laughs> hey, he's a mathematician. And, uh, you know, he wrote a form for my book. That's the best thing ever. So, uh, yeah, I named my company after him. I asked his permission first. He just said, as long as you don't sell porn, that's fine. Which so far <laughs> I have accommodated his, his request. That, that was that's an honest thing. That's actually what he, he was like. Yeah, as long as you don't sell porn. I was like, all right. Okay, I can I can deal with that. That was fine. That was not not in my mind beforehand, but uh, you know, so much for one night ultimate porn star. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that's not going to happen at this rate, huh? Okay, all right. So that's not the next one that's coming. I just want to make. Yeah, sure. wow. How about strip werewolf? Yeah, nope, <laughs> nope, nope, not, no, that. not a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I actually I didn't realize what a corner I put myself into by agreeing. Oh uh, yeah, so uh, the the suggestions are going to come on our BG go BGG one five eight nine guild and start recommending things that we could do. <laughs> we could do I actually looked at your uh, Wikipedia page and you like uh, post like thirty books on graphic tools for Illustrator, Page Maker, Photoshop, and stuff. So you had this whole other life before you made games. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a thing back then. I I loved it. I worked for Adobe for about eight years, um, and uh, was I was the group product manager for Illustrator in the Creative Suite. So. I love that stuff, and that's uh, part of me misses it, a tiny, tiny little part, but this is the best job I've ever had by far. There's there's no question about it. Can you get us a key for Adobe? A key? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think there's certain places on the internet you can go and you can get yourself set right up. It's going to be pretty easy. I'm not going to send you those links. I think you could find them yourself. <laughs> it's pretty easy to, to find those keys, but that's uh, we don't want to talk about that part either because we don't get in trouble. But before we let you go, Ted, with all of our first-time guests, we always like to have them play our game that we call Rank Them. Rank Them is a game where we're going to give you three items that you will sort or order in any way that you want, and then you tell us why you put them in that order. Ted, do you understand the rules of this game? I believe I do. All right then, Ted. Here you go. For your first, Rank Them. Now, we like to start you off slow. Start you off easy, but I think you can handle this one. Werewolf, Frankenstein, Dracula. You got to be freaking kidding me. Did I nail it? <laughs> I've got to find another question. Ted, we don't we don't run our, these questions by each other so that we can play in the game. That's my... Oh, jeesh. You're welcome. All right. Um, I'll have to think hard on... Ah, oh, crap. All right, y'all go ahead and answer. I got to come up with something else. Yeah, I'm going to have to go, uh, you know, Werewolf, Dracula, Frankenstein in that order. Um, you know, werewolves right now at this point, I'm... You know, kind of attached to um, in our in our house that we have right now. We have a gate out front, and on the gate we actually have the little um, shape of a werewolf carved into the gate in in front there, which is very cool. Um, and I'm not obsessed with them or anything, but I mean, certainly werewolves have been good to me. So yeah, we're gonna return the favor as much as we can. So yeah, love werewolves, vampires, and Dracula in particular would have to come next because he's kind of cool. I mean, you know, he's got stuff going on. Frankenstein, unfortunately. I mean, really, he's just kind of thrown together and not much, not much happening there. <laughs> the, uh, what I'm really so excited about. So have you guys seen the movie, what, what we do, what we, um, what we do in the shadows? I have not. Okay. No. It's a vampire movie from New Zealand. It's a, it's on Netflix. It's awesome. We're coming out with a sequel, um, which is based on werewolves because in this movie, they had this great scene where 
this this group is it's kind of like a pseudo documentary thing with these vampires that are going around they're kind of following them around they run into this pack of werewolves and the werewolves are uh they're basically taunting the vampires and vice versa and one of the werewolves says a bad word and the leader of werewolf goes hey hey come on now remember and all of them together go that's right we're werewolves not swear wolves oh, little no. things like that are just <laughs> awesome like and it sounds silly but it's just so much fun um and uh yeah looking forward to that so anyway werewolves dracula then frankenstein okay and while marty continues to work i rank him as in frankenstein dracula and werewolves now the reason why i rank them the way i did is based on the classic movies and the makeup that made those monsters back then when i watched those classic movies frankenstein was incredible top notch dracula i mean bella lugosi's um dracula and but just uh, over time just how well they did that but werewolves it looked like Marty in his beard. <laughs> the, the Lon Chaney, the old Lon Chaney movie where they did was really good makeup when they had him transform. I mean, that was at the time. That's pretty impressive. And did you ever have you ever looked up how they did? I mean, that it was a time intensive process of him staying in that same position as they put the stuff. Yeah, on the time space. lapse with an actor. That's pretty amazing. But you know, and, and again, given the time period it was in. And that's that's impressive but i have to agree the frankenstein makeup in general is pretty awesome and the fact that uh, herman munster was able to do it for like four seasons is pretty darn <laughs> pretty, pretty darn awesome too so uh, lily L lily who, who can forget young frankenstein too young frankenstein is a fantastic movie i totally agree and then yeah do i get to say mine now oh did you finally come up with something well no i can i say my answers to this oh one? Uh, okay i was giving you more time yeah go ahead dracula uh, werewolf and Frankenstein, because that's just in the coolest factor for me for monsters. I thought, I still think to this day, Dracula is one of the coolest classic monsters. That's one reason I enjoy the Castlevania uh, video game series, because I love the, the Dracula aspect in that one. Frankenstein, it's like, well, number one, it was... Frankenstein was the doctor. It's really Frankenstein's monster, Tony. So I just want to make sure we got that straight. Yeah, I got it straight. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I've still got to come up with my other one. So let me jump to my number two because that was going to be my number one. Here we go, Ted. October, November, or December? Uh, that's actually the order right there. October is by far, I think, my favorite month. And actually, even without Essen being in it, I would say it's my favorite month just because the weather tends to be awesome. You know, now that I'm back on the East Coast, we've lived on the West Coast for a long time. We're back on the East Coast. On the East Coast, you know, October is amazing. It's a great month. Uh, Humidity is down from wherever you live for the most part. Uh, you know, everything's beautiful. It's just a great time to be outside. It's just, it's just a really nice month. November... Uh, I don't like December as much just because of all the the overwhelming Christmas holiday stuff that goes on. It's just it's just overbearing for some part, and I know that's for our business. It's actually it's a good time because people buy a lot of stuff, but it's just so much. Um, so I would say that December is probably one of my least favorite months in general. Uh, November is not particularly a favorite one way or another, but uh, December would probably be towards the bottom of the list. All right. For me, uh, October, December, November, same reason, October, and just fall is my favorite season. Love fall, love the leaves, love all that. Don't like cleaning them up and the acorns are a pain, but, but I still fall. I enjoy the transition out of summer, especially down here in the South. Get rid of Ted, the humidity. Oh, my heavens. And then um, December, because of the festive and the decorations, I'll admit it can be overbearing. And November, you know, it's hard to be on the diet in November, but that's why it's so hard <laughs> for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for me, this one was tough. Even though I came up with this question, so I've got to give maybe the slight edge to December because I just love the whole family thing and with the kids and the Christmas, and that's a lot of fun for me. But October is right there at it because as much as we love Christmas, we love Halloween and like this entire house that I'm in, in right now is totally decked out in Halloween. My wife just goes nuts. We watch scary movies, the, the seasons are changing. So we love that. And then November, I, I enjoy, I enjoy the whole Thanksgiving thing and stuff, but the bookends of the October and December are by top it by far. For number three, Ballista, Catapult, Trebuchet. Ooh, that's a good one. Oh, that is a good one. Ah, uh, well, I helped my son build a trebuchet when in high school. I don't know why he was doing that. Um, I don't have no idea what it was, if it was actually for a class or he just wanted to have fun building a trebuchet, but he did take it to school with him at some point. So, Sher Sheriff's department didn't show up or anything like that? Yeah, exactly. So uh, that was kind of cool. 
yeah, I mean, going through the process of actually and mechanically making that work. So I think that's at the top, actually, because that was that was actually really interesting. And uh, then I would have to say probably a catapult next because, you know, whenever you see the movie and they always put some like sort of flaming ball of something and it's being shot super, super far, you know, or, you know, at the castle walls or whatever like that. That's kind of cool. And then plus seven. Yeah. 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 I understand. That, that'd be it. Yeah. <laughs> So actually, mine is going to be in the exact same order, but the reason is for the video game Age of Empires. Oh, yeah. When I was able to build a trebuchet and get one of those two of those set up, I like I've got this and just nailed, nailed the uh, enemy from far, far away. And then, of course, the catapult, you had to get a little bit closer and the ballista, you had to get really right up on it. So based on the way I like them in Age of Empires, that's how it is. Trebuchet catapult ballista now for me it'll be a catapult trebuchet and a ballista i've never seen a whole bunch of use for the spear throwing ballista i mean other than lord of the rings but you know catapult just so many jokes are around a catapult and people throwing things and (laughs) how they would throw you know cows and that kind of stuff trebuchet was never the butt so catapult trebuchet and ballista Marty, final question for Rankum. Okay. <clears throat> now, I had to pull this one out. This was uh, trying to c- think on my feet here, and I'm just going back to something that you referenced, Ted. Are you ready? Okay, sure. I'm really putting you on the spot. Farrah Fawcett, Kate Jackson, Jacqueline Smith. <laughs> That's really hard. So, uh, uh, okay, just to let you know, I did have the Farrah poster, the classic Farrah poster. Hold on. L- let, me, let me pause for all everybody. Right. For all you young people, those were the three actresses in the TV show Charlie's Angels from the 1970s. You can go look them up if you want. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, me. yeah, I had the I had the Farrah poster um, in my bedroom, as I'm sure a lot of other teen, preteen boys did at that time. Um, and, uh, but it was Kate Jackson. Kate Jackson kind of had that, she had the geeky thing going on before anybody knew what geeky nerdy was. And, you know, definitely Kate Jackson, number one, then Farrah, because she was Farrah. Um, and Jackson Smith, who I, you know, again, not that at, again, at that age, I would have, you know, declined meeting <laughs> any, any one of the three. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'd have to put them in that order. Those ladies were all so cool. Oh, wow. That's a, a for me, that's going to have to be Jacqueline Smith. Jacqueline Smith, nice. Uh, see, you got me flustered, Marty. I, I just don't know where to go here. Uh, Jacqueline, Kate, and Farah. Why? Because I need to get an answer out. Uh, oh, I guess long brunette hair and. The, oh, they, it's just, they, they were, it was such a good show. I mean, just get away from all the stuff we're associated with. That was actually a very good. You, you, you really are flustered. No. Maybe you should just stop right now. I know. It's just a good <laughs> private eye show, Bosley. I mean, oh, that was just such a fun show to watch. So for me, uh, Tony, actually, I'm with you. Uh, Jacqueline Smith, number one. Uh, I always like long hair um, brunettes, which is one reason why I'm, I married my wife. And Jacqueline actually still looks pretty pretty darn good today and then probably second was fair because again i like the long hair and then kate jackson but they were all you know very attractive women obviously they wouldn't have been on that show if they weren't now did y'all ever hear uh the whole thing with the Farrah poster where her hair spelled sex i remember hearing about that but i don't think i ever followed up with it or yeah if you look at the curls at the bottom of her hair like the way the curls are laid out it like spells sex and they said mm. they did that on purpose it's like no somebody was just kind of looking for something so i didn't know if you ever heard that rumor so anyway hey i came up with another question ted thank you so much for coming on the show i know people are so excited about essen to try out the new palaces game and then maybe hopefully uh, get whistle stop when it's back in stock and if people want to find out more about you or bezier games where can they go hey, just go to beziergames.com and we got all our stuff listed there and they can pre-order things and uh, links to videos and all sorts of other fun things now even though you said you will not have those games at uh pax unplugged or bgg con we have booths at either one of those places Yes, yeah, we're going to have booths at both places. And so we'll, we'll be showing, we'll have copies for people to play. Um, and then they'll be able to pre-order it there. So as soon as it comes in, they can grab a copy. And of course, we'll have Where Words, we'll have One Night, we'll have all our other games. Ted, thanks so much. And we can't wait to see you at one of the shows that uh, we'll be at soon. Yeah, thank you. It was great to be here.
not only is Alien Artifacts going to be available right after Essen, but there's also going to be two expansions for two very popular games from Portal, Cry Havoc and Nirishima Hex. First, for Cry Havoc, you got the Aftermath game expansion, which is going to be coming out. So you can get that game off your shelf and, and bring some new life to it. But also one game that Tony and I really enjoy, Nirishima Hex. He just keeps pumping out those new armies. And now he has the new Iron Gang that's going to be coming out to even put another twist on this classic game. So keep an eye not on Alien Artifacts, but two big expansions for two of his biggest games, Cry Havoc and Nirishima Hex. You can go check it out at portalgames.pl. Five minute initiative begins in three, two, one. I've got disclosures to make about this game, everybody. I'm going to be totally upfront. We got a review copy of Sunday Split from Renegade Games. They gave us one. We know the designer. It's Nate. It's one of our good buddies here that's also on the Scurry Report. Three, Nate beats us, beats us at every game that we play. Now, that last disclosure really doesn't mean anything to this review, but I just want to let people know, Tony, that Nate is, is really good at his games. Well, when I got to play it, I think I beat Nate. Don't don't give the boy too much credit. I think I beat him in his own game because he was busy trying to teach us the game and you lose concentration. That's true. And when you see this game, it's it's a really cute little quick uh, five, ten minute game where you're trying to collect. Well, you're trying to build Sundays and you're trying to collect sets of ice cream. You're trying to create Neapolitan. If you can create, you know, a chocolate a strawberry and vanilla, you're going to get three points. And then if you can get your uh, you whipped cream and sprinkle cards and put those together, you get five points. If you get a cherry, you can multiply the largest number of uh, one particular ice cream flavor you have. But Tony, there's vegetables in there, which are negative points, which, which are no good. But if I just explain that, people will go, well, that's Sushi Go. What's so great about it? But Tony, it's how you get the cards. That's the twist of this game that makes it so cool. Yeah, it's that drafting mechanism where one player gets to set up the draft piles for the other players. They get the last pick. You have to build those draft piles strategically. And three cards are able to be turned face down. In a four-player game, three cards can be turned face down. So there's that bluffing mechanism. Oh, those cards have sprinkles on them, and I've got whipped cream, and sprinkles go with whipped cream, so I really need to take that, but he's got a face-down card. Is that broccoli? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, well, what am I going to do there? Am I taking that pile or not? I know you. I know you, Marty. You're going to put, oh, no, you're, you're, you're trying to confuse me. There's a cherry under there, and those cherries are awesome. They really add to the point. That made the game for me. Love that mechanic. Love it. That, that's, again, uh, if you just saw this on the table and you see how the scoring works, it's very much you think sushi game go. I'm trying to collect sets. I'm trying to build in multipliers and stuff. And there's bananas. And whoever has the most bananas gets a certain amount of, of points. But it's the it's the split uh, and and choose and then the three hidden cards. That's that's really cool. Now the thing is though, and Nate will even admit this: if you're playing with people that are a little bit have some issues with AP, and it takes them four or five minutes to decide how they want to split the cards, it can make the game drag. So this is just supposed to be a light game. Get your ten cards and split them. Into, into the number, into piles, like with four people, you're going to split them into four piles and split those 10 cards however you want. Don't spend too much time thinking about it. Just put the cards down, draw the piles, and move on from there. I've played this game uh, a few times now. This is a lot of fun. I think this is one of those that you ought to keep in your uh, collection. And to me, it would probably replace Sushi Go just because of how the cards are, are dealt out as opposed to the drafting mechanic of Sushi Go. It's, it is. It is a fun little filler game. Congrats to Nate for getting this published i mean i played it i guess almost two years ago at origins when he had it when he was shopping it around and you know i was like okay this is this is unique i like this and the artwork they chose for it is really cute but it speaks to me it's got ice cream it's got i can understand <laughs> ice cream i know how that works sushi go didn't speak to me i can understand ice cream i know how ice cream sundays are built especially with bananas but yeah the vegetables why such the hate on vegetables nate i don't understand because it wants vegetables on their ice cream cones black that's negative points who knows if this is a huge success for maybe you'll have some waffle cones that come out or maybe you can dip it make it like dairy okay i'm i'm digressing here actually nate said he is already thinking about an expansion for this see what a lead-in 
God, I'm so good. Oh. Again, this is Renegade Games. This is from our good buddy, Nate Bivens. Again, maybe we're a tad biased, but we are honest in the fact that if you do have the split and divide thing and you got somebody that can take a long time, it can make the game drag a little bit. But uh, again, for a light game like this, hopefully people aren't spending too much time trying to decide how they want to lay those things out. This game is going to be available as at Essen and then out in retail soon after. It's going to be an inexpensive game. I, I can't remember the MSRP. I have not seen it was around 20 bucks or so. So it's going to be one of those you can just get and throw in your pocket and keep on the shelf and, and pull out anytime you want to play. Five minute initiative is complete. Marked another one off the list, Marty, Ted Allspot. Other than doing a pitch from 2012 when I saw him at Gen Con, <laughs> we got another designer on the show. Exciting. We tricked another person to come in and play rank them. That was, that was awesome to get him on, on, on the show. It's like uh, when they reached out to us, so we were like, uh, yeah, we want to have Ted on the show. That's a, that's a no-brainer right there. Ted's a great guy. And he's He has put out a lot of... You just don't realize how much. Yeah, exactly. And it's not only just party games, but it's also the, the heavier type games like the and stuff so he has a good breadth of games that covers all, all different sorts of aspects so i can't wait to see what else is coming out from the end and again i really love his rare words game ah oh, such a fun little party game and i'll admit it and i'm saying this here and i'll do it werewolf legacy that's i don't know it may be hit or, i don't know it's got to be worth a try i love legacy i love the legacy so yeah i, I can't wait to see uh, what, what he's going to do with that and he mentioned some other maybe bigger box games so definitely keep an eye on what they're doing over at bezier games one project i want to talk about was from our friend ivan van norman who's over at the geek and sundry you may see him on some of the board game videos he's teaching some videos and sometimes he'll do some playthroughs he has a new kickstarter out for a brand new rpg or not actually it's not an RPG, it's a re-released RPG that's been retweeted called Outbreak. This is a survival RPG. Somewhat felt to me kind of like a little like uh, end of the world RPGs from FFG because you play as yourself. And I've talked about this on the show, Tony. When you play an RPG as yourself, it is feels totally different. You don't role play as other people. You're role playing your, as yourself, and sometimes you have to make tough decisions. And I mentioned how, as our family, we played, and there was this a weird thing going on. And somebody tried to take Brett, and Vanessa was freaking out and stuff. And that's what this is, except it's an apocalypse. And basically, it's not like if you're going to die, it's when you're going to die. And the idea is that you yourself, and you're just in a real world situation. You don't have magic powers. You don't have super strength or anything like that. You're just you trying to stay alive. That sounds like a really tense experience. You know, role playing, one day we'll do Lord of the Rings, but maybe I can cut my teeth if we do it as ourselves. I can do that. Well, it, it is easier to play because you, you know what you would you would do. We actually did an end of this world uh, with some of the guys like Rodney and Joel uh, and Matt at uh, BGG Con. And it was this weird thing where there was a zombie outbreak and it got real, really quick when somebody attacked like Joel or something like that, let him die. <laughs> well, no, in a, in a, in a uh, fantasy RPG, you may go, ah, who cares? Don't want to try to save him. But it's like, no, wait a minute. I, there's a connection here. I know yeah, this guy mm -hmm. and that's what this is instilling. Now this is a little bit more crunchy, uh, than, uh, into the world. Uh, in the fact that, uh, the character development's a little more crunchy than the end of the world series. If this is something that you're interested in, it's, it's already funded. Uh, it looks intense. Uh, again, you play as yourself. You're just kind to deal with what's going on in the world with this outbreak that's that's going on. Again, it's not uh, it's not necessarily if you'll die, it, it's when you die. So it's currently on Kickstarter. You can go check our website for a link and go check it out. Speaking of Kickstarters and speaking of ranting, I've got two. Uh-oh, here we go. Yeah. All right. First off, Berkey, you're killing me. Can you believe what he did? Can you are, believe the man is, he, he's, he's put out the new size, the Mycroft, the 48 by 72. I got to make a decision now. 48 inches is perfect for our miniature game. Yep. In fact, oh. I, was, I was talking to somebody. It was like, uh, I was actually talking to Joel Lady from Drive Through Review. He's a big miniature gamer. He said, oh, I just wish there was a table that was four foot. 
and then it that unlocked and now there's a four foot which is perfect for like you said for like war machine 40k and stuff like that that's a sweet size especially for miniature gamers yeah i know but you know once again i gotta go to the cfo and talk to her about this because you know, <laughs> we gotta look yeah. at it from a size standpoint how you know uh, oh man because that's you know i was talking to her about it and as we move into this new house and pack i promised her that you know there'd be no more new games coming into the house for a while until we get all this moved and settled and figured out and now i got to talk to her about oh goodness oh another hard choice has to be made but this leads to the second one god you you doing a lot of, oh oh man, i know it's oh. just irritating to me because it's frustrating because I promised Donna no more new games would come into the house. Not while we got this. And then Miniature Market goes and has their sale. Mm -hmm. And I quickly, I'm, I got stuff, I'm loading stuff into my cart. I'm saying, oh, I'm going to hear about this. Oh, this is not going to be good when these games show up on my doorstep. So I've got Power Grid, the card game coming in, and I forget what else. I've got all that in the cart. I ask you if you want something. You said, yeah, I want some of these card sleeves that would help out. What did you want the card sleeves for? Was it for um, the uh, War of the Ring? Uh, yeah, it was a War of the Ring. It was a sleeve of all those cards, yes. Yeah, so I log in. I'm getting ready to go. I get ready to hit the checkout button. I hit the checkout button, and it goes, oh, by the way, the following items are no longer available. What? What are you talking about? I just put this in my cart. What do you mean? Did somebody come up like they do at Black <laughs> Friday shopping and take them out of my cart? Why are they not still in my cart? You, what is this crap, miniature market? I don't understand this. You tell me about that. And I didn't understand that either. Cause typically, you know, when you go and like order uh, tickets for games or concerts and stuff, but I have a little clock. that says, we're holding these for you for the next three minutes. If you don't mm -hmm. pay, they're gone. I'm really surprised their point of sale system or their uh, online sale system does not do that to where basically they mark those as unavailable for a few minutes until you check out or, or, or leave. Yeah. And, but I've known that they've always done this and I forget that. So every Every year when they do these big sales around the Christmas time or just now their fall clearance sale and it happens again, it is still just mm, grinds the old gears for me sometimes. So I'm just like this, fine. I just said, empty my cart, remove these items. Fine. I'm not buying anything. And I lived up to my promise not to do anything for Donna to bring any new games. So there, thank you, Miniature Market, for keeping me to my promise. Thank you for your crappy interface system for saving my marriage. Uh, I really wanted Power Grid, the card game, though. <laughs> I really wanted that. Well, well, maybe in the future. So I'll go look and see if the fun again has it in, ready to go. Because right, once I get moved, my gosh, we are going to be shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you have a uh, table topper that you'll be able to play on for all, have all those new games to put on. Yeah, that, that oh, got to make a decision that closes right I'm after sorry. this drops. Game toppers. Game, I'm game sorry. Topper. I keep saying table covers because it goes, goes on top of a table, but it's yeah, game, game topper. toppers. Yeah, that closes, you know, the day after this show drops. So you got, uh, yeah, well, if you've listened to it um, multiple days after this drops and you missed out. So, wow. Are we going to get together and play some more games? I can't wait. Yes, it seems like we're starting to get into a little pattern here of a certain night that we're getting together, and I can't wait to see what's on the docket for next week. I can guarantee it won't be one of Vital Lacerda's games. Uh, probably not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Actually, I would love uh, to sit down. I, actually, all of us, after we were done with Liz Boa, this like, we've got to get together and play this again soon before we forget how to play. Again, it's not one of those things that's super hard, but you kind of have to kind of relearn the board and the iconography and everything, and while it's fresh in our minds we want to get it to the table again you know you had that news flash about fields of rl expansion at the beginning yes you know what else was on the um fun again page for s and pre-releases what lorenzo el magnifico expansion oh yes you, you still can't order it there was still not a pre-order button there but they, they had it listed insta buy it, it may be my euro game of the year at this point yeah we gotta start doing that man do you realize we will be compiling year in and getting the squirrely words squirrel squirrel squirrely, squirrely words awards, squirrely words maybe instead of werewolf words they can do squirrely award words we'll tell we'll talk to ted about that yeah yeah squirrely awards we gotta start compiling our list yes we do uh it's a big deal every year every january we always have our big squirrely award show we have a bunch of guests come on and present the awards for us but yeah we'll be compiling those numbers within the next couple months Let's get busy. So let's stop talking and keep rolling dice and taking names.
Thanks for listening. Don't forget to join our BGG Guild 1589. Come like us on Facebook and make sure to follow us on Twitter at Dyson Names in order to enter into the contest. All right, Tony, here's Werewolf in London. Listen. Okay. okay, here's Sweet Home Alabama. Listen. See, it's the same thing. The Essen Mule service is over for fun again, but, but, but they do want to try and bring the hottest games back and put them into the warehouse so that you can get those hot Essen games straight to your doorstep. So make sure to go keep an eye out at funagain.com for a lot of the pre-orders that are going to be coming up for all these hot Essen games so that hopefully you can get those to your house in time for the holidays and at a discounted price if you put in a pre-order and are a member. Go check them out at funagain.com.